uh, at Everledger. What I am mostly focused on is how to meet different types of impact requirements as well as voluntary initiatives. And what I'll be speaking to are some of the regulatory requirements that uh, are happening both in the US as well as Europe and others that are popping up in Australia and East Asia. Um, I'm gonna present a video with Pamela, um, a former colleague of mine uh, at the US State Department. And Pamela covers critical materials and we're gonna be focused on those types of uh, activities uh, you know, and how people can meet those. So I'm just going to switch over to my laptop just because Excellent. my internet's yeah. a little thank weak you. this morning. So just yeah, a second. thank you. Hi, thank you so much for joining us today, Pamela. Um, I am just thrilled to be able to have this conversation with you. We've known each other for several years, and I'm going to let you just do your own introduction uh, to this audience, and uh, we'll kick it off there. So handing over to you. Hey, Carrie, I am so delighted to be here today. I mean, it's um, one, I am so passionate about this work, but I also love any opportunity to work with you. I just think you're great, and so I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I'm Pamela Fierce Walsh. I'm the Senior Advisor for State Department's um, Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. Uh, I handle conflict and critical minerals. So I span everything from the Kimberley process to Dodd-Frank 1502 to uh, critical mineral supply chains and that that issue is a national security concern as well as looking at, at U.S. Um, abilities and partnerships overseas long term and how to source um, for diverse supply chains. So that's that's kind of me in a nutshell, Gary. So great. You are the perfect person to have this conversation with. So again, thank you for making this time. Um, I think just to kick off, maybe we can start off with what are critical materials? What are conflict minerals? And just give me like a little bit of perspective of how those are used because they're both terms of art as well as kind of anecdotally, we just kind of throw them out. So maybe you sure. can give a little bit more context to it. Sure. Um, I think maybe just start with a quick clarification, right? So a conflict mineral is not actually a term of art. It's an actual classification under U.S. law. So under Dodd-Frank 1502, which covers, quote, conflict minerals, um, it requires companies using, quote, them in their materials um, uh, to report to the SEC their efforts um, on conflict-free supply chains. A conflict mineral under Dodd-Frank is currently defined as tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold. So 3TG as we call them. Now critical minerals, um, that does have a little bit more variance about it because every government in the world has a set of minerals they care about and they're not always exactly the same there's a lot of overlap but they can they can diverge um, in the case of the United States our critical minerals list consists of 35 things declared by the US Geological Survey um, as ones that are critical for US national security and our economy and it includes the three T's so when you're talking about critical minerals, you are talking in large part about some very important conflict minerals, but they're, they're a subset. And I should note here that a rare earth is a critical mineral, but not all critical minerals are rare earth. I always need to make that decision distinction for people. Um, so I'm sure your learned audience will get that, but just so we're super clear. And gold for the United States is not a critical mineral. It nonetheless has a lot of attention on it because its supply chain has a lot of problems for threat finance, environment, human labor, etc. There you go. That is incredibly helpful. Thank you, Pam, um, for that clear classification and differentiation between these. Um, maybe we can start off with then taking critical materials, since that's the larger umbrella um, term, and, and let's talk about what it means in the United States for these 35 that were part of a recent executive order, and maybe you can kind of give uh, more detail about that. Absolutely. So in December of 2017, the president's 
signed executive order 13953, which um, one, instructed the Department of Interior, which includes the U.S. Geological Survey, to come up with the list of critical minerals, and then to assemble a federal strategy pursuant to that list of minerals and how to lessen U.S. reliance on those sources um, from overseas. It's real, that executive order really at its core is about improving domestic access and capability in the mineral and mining space. So you've got, ta you've got taskers there, uh, we call those are assignments in the government, um, for say the Department of Interior to look at permitting or um, the US Geological Survey to look at mining and education and how we do that in the United States. And then, or the Department of Energy, which has a really big role to play in development of kind of um, advanced technologies. And then the Department of Defense even has its own separate set of expensive, um, well, extensive and expensive and expansive authorities related to minerals because the DOD has such a um, specific need in its supply chain. But in that executive order from 2017, you'll find the State Department isn't even mentioned. Um, but it does nonetheless require us to work with international partners and allies because in some of these cases, the United States doesn't have immediate access to these materials. Uh, or to these minerals or to the refining capacity. And so it's focused on shoring up that domestic aspect, but still reinforces the need for international. So I came along and I said, guys, uh, we need international partnerships. Hello. Uh, and I've been a very busy woman ever since. <laughs> I bet. I bet. So maybe yeah. you could talk a little bit about sort of how you're engaging internationally um, with the private sector and how others could, uh, you know, support this effort. And maybe a little bit also of how the U.S. looks at critical materials and maybe how Europe does. Right. So really good question. So before that executive order was signed in 2017, um, State Department and my team in particular was really engaged with the conflict mineral set, which brought us right together with smelters and refiners and the downstream companies that rely on these products for their commodities for their products, right? So the tech companies, the auto companies, the jewelry companies, the aerospace companies, the medical technology companies, those industries were very interested in how they could be a part of conflict-free supply chains. When the critical minerals policy set kind of started to evolve to have a, um, a geostrategic lens or, or a supply chain diversification imperative around it, we, we knew immediately that it was important to partner closely with U.S. allies and partners to ensure that mutual perspectives on important issues were being achieved in, in each of our different spheres. So as the White House had publicly announced a few years ago, we established a working group with uh, and critical minerals bilateral dialogue with our partners in Canada. So through Natural Resources Canada, we have a, an active and robust set of working groups. Um, we engage with interagency partners in the US to kind of match up with their counterparts in Canada to make sure that we're really sinking <laughs> positions. And then we have a similar setup with the government of Australia. Um, another producing country that's a, a close partner of the United States that sees value in supply chain diversification as a means of security, as well as just a, a means of good business sense, right? I mean, it's never, it's never a wise move to have everything consolidated at any particular uh, specific location, right? Um, and I think COVID has taught us that, right? You need supply chains that are nimble and you need to know what's in them. So all of the supply chain tracing kind of lexicon from the conflict minerals world is really applicable in the critical mineral sense, even though you're not necessarily talking about rooting out conflict minerals in, in every commodity, you still want to know what the process who's my partner where is it coming from who's buying it what's it used for and knowing that information empowers every aspect of the supply chain it just it just does and it's going to continue to be very important as we move forward now partners um, in other other countries say the European Union or in Japan they have um, very similar and 
overlapping interests and they're very good partners. The European Union just um, put out its very impressive critical minerals strategy, um, raw materials strategy, and their colleagues at DG Grow and DG Trade, uh, my colleagues in those places, um, are really inspiring in their long-term vision for how they um, envision reaching Europe's kind of clean energy goals in this space. Um, so there's a lot of overlap and a lot of compatibility in how these particular partners work. We've also got really interesting stuff uh, happening with partners in Latin America, as well as through our Prosper Africa initiative, which is designed to increase um, U.S. investment in, in critical mineral, well, Prosper Africa generally is designed to increase U.S. investment um, on the continent of Africa, but we've established a, a mineral sector support team that's really intended to, to kind of improve how we can bring minerals projects to bear. It's a lot going on um, and it's it's a really busy space, but it's, it's a very exciting one. And I really also have to mention uh, the State Department's Energy Resource Governance Initiative handled by my colleagues in the Bureau of Energy Resources. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic initiative that uh, they've put forward that's focused on critical energy minerals. So the subset of critical minerals, plus a couple others that are really important for stuff like, you know, uh, clean batteries or, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm saying, I'm thinking greenhouses, not greenhouses, uh, solar panels. Greenhouse. So, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, solar panels. Um, and it's a, it's a multilateral initiative that brings international partners together to basically sign up for standards that are elevated in the mineral sourcing space. So, so very exciting stuff happening. This is incredible. That was just a load of information that we are going to dice out and we'll get links to everyone who's listening. And so we'll make sure we parse that out so everyone has the information. But as everyone can see, Pam is just a wealth of information. And this is why we were so excited to have her in this interview. Maybe you can also just do a dive on U.S. conflict minerals legislation versus what the EU is putting out on you know, it's now right. uh, you know, implementing right. their own. And how does that compare and contrast? And, you know, just as an overview, because I think that is something that people still get a little wrapped around the axle in terms of how they need to differentiate that. Right. So, um, again, conflict minerals, subset of critical minerals. Conflict minerals under Dodd-Frank 1502, which remains U.S. law for anyone asking, um, uh, for Dodd-Frank 1502 um, pertains to those, the 3TG coming out of DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, or any of its nine neighbors. And that requires reporting to the SEC if you're, if you're a listed company on your, if your product has those commodities these in them as material to the product. Okay, you have to report on those uh, minerals uh, reporting efforts. The European legislation, which comes into force in January, covers the same minerals, so same 3TG. However, it is global. It's global for application in areas considered conflict or high risk. Now, why is that important? Just like with Dodd-Frank, the EU legislation is, is a proponent of the OECD due diligence guidelines for sourcing minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. So US legislation focuses just on that one CARA, we call it. The EU legislation, however, requires that no matter where you've sourced it, if you've sourced it from a place that's considered to be a CARA, now, there's a little bit of a rub there because the EU has not yet published a list of what it considers CARAs. Um, that's a tricky spot for them to be in, I can imagine, um, because you don't want to you don't want to call out one place and forget to call, you know, forget to highlight needs on another place. Um, this, I think the spirit behind their legislation is not to identify go and no-go areas where you can source from. That's never the intention behind due diligence. It's about ensuring that where you do source, you're, contri you're not contributing to the problem what, and, and, in a, a, it, according to the due diligence guidelines. And so um, with the EU, I think there's, there's still going to be a little bit of that like ambiguity. Now their legislation requires importers of those materials to do the reporting. And they have to be audited against um, a number of certified audit mechanisms. So there was, I know, um, 
I say this without endorsement. I just know some of the ones that they've looked at are like, you know, the Responsible Jewelry Council's audits or the Responsible Minerals Initiatives audits. Um, so those are tools that the European Union will say you, these are some of the ones that are approved. You have to use one of these if you're if you're importing. Um, so the, the regulatory weeds are a little bit different, um, but those are the general thrusts. This is excellent. Thank you so much. Um, maybe as just a closing, are there other ways that people could learn about this or that they should be reaching out um, that you would recommend or other information that you would like, like to throw out before we close? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that I think this issue is, again, a fascinating and one I'm passionate about, but we're just scratching the surface on the extent of the solutions we need to bring to bear to the problem, right? So I've mentioned a few of them. I've mentioned Department of Interior, I've mentioned USGS, both of whom have great websites with lots of resources on them. Um, but you also need the Environmental Protection Agency, which we work with on recycling, or you need even more engagement from the Department of Energy to look at advanced recycling. You need DOD to bring supply, sta supply standards into their um, procurement regs, right? Like so much happening in this space from so many different parts of the government. So I'd be the first to say that we don't really have a centralized belly button as yet on it. And, and that just is what it is. If you ever have questions, please reach out to me at the U.S. Department of State. This is what we work on all day long. I can get you in touch with anybody that you think might be helpful for your needs. And we would really love to hear from you. So um, Carrie, feel free to give uh, my email address to your, your audience. And I hope to hear from you, whether you're private sector, public sector, think tank, NGO, private sector company, you're upstream, middle stream, downstream. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks a lot. The whole kit and caboodle. Everybody. Uh, that's <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you again. Um, Good luck with the rest of the year. Stay safe and healthy, and uh, we'll be in touch for sure. Thanks so much. Excellent, Carrie. Great. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I have any questions here for you, Carrie. Carrie, did you want to add anything to that too yeah, before we go into questions? As you Carrie, did you want to add anything? Um, Friend. Ooh. Oh, sorry. sorry. You may want to mute one of them. To... We're hearing echoing a little bit. Sorry about that. Or there's like a little feedback. I'm not sure. Sorry, I thought I had mute it. Oh, no muted problem. It. No, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Scott. Um, just a couple other things that I'll flag to that. You know, I think it's good for this audience just to hear uh, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Not that Pamela is anything like a horse, but uh, she, um, you know, she's a wealth of information. But one of the reasons that we engage so much with government is that uh, Everledger received a grant from the Department of Energy. Uh, and I can share some of those videos um, after this call uh, with the group here, as well as Scott through um, some of the write-ups that we'll be doing on, on some of these topics. Um, our grant, uh, tracks battery materials from both uh, electric vehicle batteries as well as from uh, portable electronics. And these materials are part of that critical material subset. Uh, like Scott mentioned, we do track from the point of you know minerals in certain cases such as diamonds and other materials as well as soft goods, fabrics, cottons, uh, wool, et cetera, and then also from somewhere in the midstream for full circular economy applications. So something uh, that would be at the point of manufacturing forward through first life, second life, and so on. Um, what we do with the Department of Energy grant is issue uh, the different types of technologies that can be for portables that might be identifying it by its immediate uh, identification that you can find readily on it. In the electric vehicle battery world, we might apply NSC tags or other uh, types of technologies to it to track through. Um, that will include information such as state of health um, so that they can be assessed quickly in terms of whether or not it is viable. A, a second car, for example, or if it needs to be refurbished and that can be refurbished into power storage units, um, as well as other things. If it can't be used, then we also look at opportunities for it to be used and recycled um, directly. But there's a lot of different applications and we take batteries, for example, and we'll uh, track down to not just 
the overall module of the battery, but down to the cell um, when you're in, uh, down to the individual um, arrays and, and, and smaller uh, activity or smaller units. And so what this can do is enable circular economy um, for existing products at any stage of its life. Um, but I'll send you some videos on that as well, but these are the types of materials um, and examples of products that have to be tracked. And so one of the things we're working with different battery industry groups is to meet some of these critical material uh, goals um, for the executive order, for example, where they want you to focus on sourcing from North America and specifically the United States. Um, maybe don't think about new mines, but also think about urban mining and existing circular economy applications. Um, and so those are some things that, you know, in this group, we can talk through in more detail um, or you know, separately if you wanna have a sidebar, but happy to talk through this. Um, just one last uh, little bit of information that with the, the EU uh, initiatives on you know, regulation on battery and e-waste, there's also gonna be a cost uh, perspective. And I just read this this morning, but um, for measure three on the collection rate target for portable batteries, the preferred option is that 65% collection target by 2025 and a 70% collection target by 2030. Um, these options are estimated to cost around uh, 1.09 euros and 1.43 euros per capita each year respectively to be financed through the mechanism of extended producer responsibility. So until we start really tracking fully these materials, this new legislation and regulation that is continuing um, in many different aspects uh, will be, become more and more complicated, more and more costly. And so we invite um, those here, you know, and, uh, and it doesn't matter if you're the battery world or apparel world or that you are really focused on the uh, the activities of being a think tank or an expert. We love the collaboration, so really invite those conversations going forward. Um, thanks for the time. Um, oh, and quick, quick question, Carrie. Uh, James had a question. Uh, oh yeah, please. Thanks, Carrie. Really, really great uh, yeah. presentation and a really apt uh, conversation for us to be having. Can you speak a bit to what Everledger can do at the end of life phase for tracking critical metals? You were talking about sort of use and second use. Is there a way that recyclers can be involved in this as well in tracking Absolutely. material flows through that? Absolutely. And, you know, I am not an anti-audit person at all. So, um, but I will say that I think audits have run their course of how much they can do on their own. Um, I used to work for an audit company, ran these sort of things. And so recyclers right now is that, you know, you're very familiar is that, they are exposed to a lot of audits to verify and there's a lot of fraud in the waste management world. So fair enough. Um, but what isn't actually captured is that per product coming in and really per product going out or per you know unit of measurement going out, um, there's mass valves and all these things, but it's like fully accurate in technology. So what we can be actually doing is bringing in when they are capturing certain products. And this is, let me, focus on, uh, let's say, high value assets like an electric vehicle battery. We can actually show what would be likely scenarios of how much material would be able to be recycled or and at what quantities, because when you have certain per permissioned elements of what that battery is made of, and then the state of health of what can be refurbished and sent separately to a refurbisher versus the recycler, it's not a black box under the, we, we categorize certain people as recycler slash disassemblers, that they're more doing the disassembly before it goes off to an actual yeah, refiner. The actual processing. But, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that actually does the processing. And so that's where we're breaking up those activities and then the likelihood of what would actually uh, you know, be you know, produced in those activities. And then those actors can properly account for that, um, you know, for the good actors and the ones that are more, that could be more fraudulent um, would be uh, it would just be a harder barrier to entry um, to take those actions that would be fraudulent and, and you just you know what I've noticed with a lot of fraud activities once you cross the threshold of it being more complicated um, actors start going to the easier things to make uh, quick money from so that that's what we're our goal is just to make it so it's easier more effective 
uh, uh, you know, make sure we uh, avoid and reduce or hopefully ultimately eliminate fraudulent activities, and then also um, make it more efficient for those that are reporting on it. Um, but yeah, and even, uh, you know, as our suite of services, as opposed to just tracking, we're looking at ways that you even become discoverable as someone who collects plastics. Um, you know, I mean, in the future world, we should be enabling unique collection, unique segregation. And this can be, you know, part of the gig economy world. And you see startups and activities around this for food waste um, and certain, you know, electronics and the ITAD world, but you're not seeing it for things like plastics or the future of, you know, repair for toys or other things. Um, different groups that have been on this, uh, these types of conversations, terror cycle has been part of that and they're segregating it but that's just one of you know hundreds of types of, of models that actually start making real circular economy plays um, if they were able to have a more distributed model for their tracking and, and their systems and discoverability and engagement in the whole economy excellent 